Welcome to Marketing Tales with Chris Raposo, a podcast created to spotlight and highlight marketers, tell their stories, and share their knowledge with those interested in all things marketing. If you're interested in more than just the cut and dry strategies and tactics, and want to learn more about the human side of his guests and how they got to where they are today, then this show is for you. I'm familiar with the term writing for the web. Is there a difference between web smart writing and how it differs from traditional content writing? You know, the first thing I do when I meet a prospective client is I go to their program pages and I read their philosophy page, program page, and I read their economics program page. And, you know, 99 out of 100 times, the content on those pages could have been written in 1953 or 1973. It really hasn't been updated for the reality of what these programs mean in terms of career opportunity. Uh, and I think that's an example of how the Googlebot is coming along to your website every day. You know, it doesn't take a vacation, it doesn't go to lunch, it, it comes faithfully every day. And it lands on your philosophy page and it says, does this college care about philosophy? And if so, how so? Um, and if you write that program content in a way that communicates both to the human reader and the Googlebot, that you care about philosophy as it relates to today's realities in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of uh, the ways in which um, any online uh, company or product uh, or application thinks about the value of an, of an economist in a completely different way than we might have when all the economists went to DC and sort of swam in this big you know, sea of government data and tried to make sense of it. That's not what a lot of economists do today. They're working for Airbnb trying to figure out what is it about uh, a client's path through a website that makes them routinely abandon their purchase at this stage rather than that stage or makes them complete their purchase. Mm -hmm. So if you can start to think differently about the content on your web page or on your social media, you can sort of get inside the mind of the Google algorithm. And then the trick always is to, you know, and this is something I'm still learning to do, which is you're always learning to write for two audiences at once. Mm -hmm. You're writing for a human being and you're writing for the Google bot. And the trick is for the human to never know that you're writing for the bot and for the bot to never know that you're writing for the human. And that's, that's web smart writing. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Marketing Tales show with Chris Raposo. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Todd Urkel from Alliance, joining us from Pittsburgh, PA. Todd, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be here. Awesome. Hey, Todd, you're going to host a webinar. You're going to run a webinar for Hannon Hill next week. So it's going to be on web smart writing. And this episode is going to focus on the art of web smart writing to further... Um, you know, bring awareness to how to do that for higher ed institutions or any business really who's listening to this right. um, to this episode. So I did a little bit of research on you, Todd. Uh, noticed that you have a degree in English from the University of Pittsburgh, and you're currently the Chief Content Officer at Alliance. Can you give us a little bit of background about your journey into the world of web content marketing, what you love about it, sure. and about the company of Alliance? I know you worked in uh, publishing before you started there. Yeah. You know, I came to Alliance with a long background in newspaper and magazine work. Uh, I worked for Pitt Magazine at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we transitioned from a, you know, a sort of faculty-led tabloid to a true four-color university magazine. Uh, we were finalists for the Sibley Award uh, two times, maybe three. Um, and we, pre you know, we set a pretty high bar in terms of uh, story content. You know, we used to look at that magazine and say, uh, this is how old I am. Uh, we used to look at it and say, could we put this on a newsstand and sell it? Mm -hmm. You know, the content warrants somebody spending their hard earned money for the magazine. So um, I know newsstands don't exist anymore. But uh, um, so, yeah, you know, I came to Alliance with a deep background um, uh, in, in journalism and magazine writing. Uh, at one point, I started to do more and more enrollment uh, focused work for colleges around the country. Uh, through various agencies, you know, I started, you know, sitting in with presidents and provosts and sort of understanding more of the strategic part mm -hmm. of the communication. And uh, so I brought all that to Alliance in around 2006. Uh, and Abu, uh, the founder of Alliance, you know, he has a really deep, solid computer science background. And uh, Alliance at that point had really 
uh, sort of made its name creating just great, robust, rock solid websites for banks and corporations. And, and uh, so we sort of, you know, merged our, our, our strengths and, and started to build a, a real higher ed practice at that point. Um, and uh, over the last 20 years, that, that practice has really grown. And you're a preferred partner with the Hand and Hill company that I work for. And we really appreciate the collaboration we have with you because you're experts in, in your particular fields. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, uh, not having a computer science background, not being a digital native, um, you know, it's it's been some hard lessons for me in terms of content management systems that yeah. I would describe as not very content friendly. Uh, yeah. And uh, when I discovered Hannon Hill and, where, and when the team here would sort of show me the ways in which content could really be leveraged um, on on the on the behalf of stories in in the Hand and Hill content system. I mean, I was I was really elated because I had seen so many great ideas kind of suffer under bad systems. So so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Todd. Um, so when we uh, schedule the episode, it, it, it derived from our um, webinar that we're going to host next week on, like I said, web smart writing. So I'm familiar with the term writing for the web. Is there a difference between web smart writing and how it differs from traditional content? writing? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I came up with web, web smart writing as a, as a clever title or a hopeful clever title. Uh, and now I have to live up to it. Right. <laughs> so, um, but, as, but as I was thinking about the webinar and, and I was thinking through um, what I could do to really give people something of value, you know, the thing I thought mo most about were the people that I've worked with over the years Um when I joined Alliance, it was the first time I ever met an information architect. Mm. It was the first time I ever met a user experience specialist. It was the first time I ever met an interactive designer. Um, and it was really in, in collaborating with those people. And really, you know, this was in the early days of my sort of transitioning from an analog print world to a digital world. Um, I really began to see that, that um, the idea that that had developed pretty quickly, I think, when when digital surfaced, the idea was people do not like to read or people don't have time to read or people, to, you know, there were all these sort of like, um, you know, and as a writer, that's not the, that's not always the greatest news, right? People don't want to read. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, there was something in me, some stubborn part of me that thought that can't really be true. There, mm. There's got to be a deeper truth to it. And I think what I learned working with information architects, user experience people, interaction designers is that what people don't want is friction. They don't want their journey, their experience, their search, their whatever action they're out to complete. They don't want it to be unnecessarily derailed, right? Yeah. Um, and the issue of whether or not they want to read content can only be answered in the in the context of well is the overall experience one that facilitates any number of things you know um, and so it's from that perspective that I thought web smart writing can look at writing as an element mm -hmm. rather than as an absolute like will people read copy or will they not read copy will they you know um, and I think the other thing that people the conclusion that they jump to sometimes is that it's all about length, you know, that it's either, it's a question of short or long. Mm -hmm. um, and while we all recognize that, you know, mobile and, and voice and a lot of other things put real constraints on you in terms of word length, um, the ultimate decision somebody makes regarding a piece of content really is not a short, long decision. Mm -hmm. It is a value, non-value decision. Um, does this content add some value to whatever it is, you know, whatever goal I'm trying to uh, accomplish? So, um, you know, one of my colleagues used to use the phrase distraction factory. You know, he said, are we creating fa value or are we creating a distraction factory? And I think every time you sit down to create digital content, you're faced with that, that decision because it's pretty easy to create a distraction factory. All the tools are there you know absolutely just look at youtube i mean goodness how many how many hours do i spend on that uh platform right you right. did write a um a blog post for hand and hill in preparation and promotion of the webinar and i there's a part in there that i found very fascinating when you talked about what does the brain say 
And you talked about the neuroscience behind it. And you talked about that the brain reacts fundamentally to the different ways information and story is related uh, relate. And um, whether it's a low grade blog post or which makes the brain idle, or if you tell a person a story, we're all hardwired for stories. And then you, you, um, you quoted author Annette Simmons in there, um, how to capture an audience's mood in the story factor. And you said, people don't want more information, she writes. They are up to their eyeballs and information. They want faith, faith in you, your goals, your success, and the story you tell. So tell us a little bit more about the psychology right. behind that, the behaviors that play into creating um, web smart content. Right. I mean, you know, Chris, think about dreaming. Uh, what is dream, right? You know, uh, we go to sleep every night. Our, we are so hardwired for story that we stay up our night, all night telling ourselves stories, yeah. you know, even while we're sleeping, you know, it's like fundamental to memory development. And, um, but it's true, you know, they put, uh, they put people in functional MRI machines and they read them sort of, you know, general brochure kind of copy information and, and nothing happens. The brain just sort of, you know, um, but if you start to read a story where there's, you know, character setting plot, where there's rising, falling action, um, the brain just all the the memory centers of the brain just suddenly light up like a Christmas tree. Um, so that they they know there's a primal reason we've been painting on caves and sculpting characters and and using hieroglyphics and you know I mean it's sort of it is hardwired into our biology. So the idea that the smartphone came along and all that just magically disappeared, I'm skeptical. So, um, yeah. or maybe I'm faithful about the power of a good story. And I, yeah, I, th I, I love that quote from uh, Annette Simmons, you know, because I think um, the other thing about digital is that we can, you know, we can sort of increase the pile of pages and, and data and information, you know, without a lot of uh, constraint. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, oftentimes when we begin a web project with a client, you know, we'll we'll archive the entirety of their existing website, and it's you know it's grown exponentially. They're you know they have a six thousand page archive or they have a nine thousand page archive, um, and then when you start to take a critical eye to that and say, well, how much of that is distraction factory and how much of that is you know useful content, um, you know that's where the the real work begins. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I think uh, you know it's again back to the, all those lessons I learned from UX and IA people, which is, you know, what's the task and and how do we facilitate it uh, with any number of things, with interaction, with content, with imagery, with with type, with design. Um, so um, I think we're you know we're all on the same mission. Yeah, hundred percent. And I I. Uh... I know that you looked at a lot of websites, a lot of content, and with the web, the vastness of digital content available out there in the business world, why is it more critical than ever for brands and businesses to embrand a web smart writing approach to stand above the fold, above the noise? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, we, we do, I mean, we're a full service agency, so we do, uh, a fair amount of brand work. And, uh, you know, anytime you kind of wade into those waters, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky place to be right. Yeah. Trying to, you know, especially when you're helping an institution that's a hundred years old, 150 years old, um, you know, they may be in the midst of an enrollment crisis, you know, their endowment may be dwindling, you know, there are any number of reasons that bring people to that decision that they've got to look at their brand. Uh, so the stakes, the stakes are high. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we often look at, you know, so what are the best brands that we know of on the planet? You look at a brand like Apple, right? Uh, I mean, it's a master. What's, what's uh, so much of the brand equity in a company like Apple and a product like Apple is, is caught up in their ability to communicate. I mean, the products are great. The technology is wonderful, but if Apple did not communicate the value of its brand, um, and the meaning of its brand as well as it does, or a brand like Nike, or a brand like Volvo, or a brand like Southwest Airlines, you know, um, I mean, there are companies like Interbrand that actually do valuation studies that show um, which part of this value can be assigned to the brand, and it's it's really staggering, you know, it's in the billions of dollars. Um, 
no, colleges, higher education colleges and universities tend not to think in those terms. Mm -hmm. But we try to bring that mindset, that sensibility to to the brand work that we do, because um, ultimately your ability to communicate and to create not just content, but productive content will affect not just the enrollment bottom line, but the uh, fundraising potential that you have, the you know, uh, your ability to track major gifts, uh, lifelong donors, um, your ability to engage in alum alumni, and your ability to attract partners. So, um, you know, a lot of times these projects begin in the admissions enrollment office or in the marketing office when they really are strategic projects. You know, they really are cabinet level, presidential level, mm -hmm. board level projects. And the to the extent that you can get boards and cabinets and presidents engaged around these questions, um, the, the better, you know, the better the project will go. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges is, is that content choices tend to get um, marginalized maybe a bit in higher education uh, or, or there's, you know, there's a fair amount of possessive sort of behavior in higher ed, what well, this belongs to me, not to you. Uh, we're going to do this in marketing, not in enrollment, or we're going to do this in advancement, not in marketing. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we try to go in with with beginner's eyes, we don't see the way a school is organized. It's really irrelevant to the customer. You know, when we when we log on to Amazon, which a lot of us do a lot, um, you know, we don't see Amazon from an organizational viewpoint. We see Amazon in terms of what we want. You know, we're trying to accomplish a task, which is to buy what we need. Yeah. Uh, Amazon is not interested in telling us, you know, the supply routes that they've changed between you know, your town and my town, that's not relevant to, the, to our choice. And yet higher ed is really sort of adamant sometimes about saying, well, that's not how we're organized departmentally or, and, you know, it's, it's our work to sort of say, well, like, let's look at the world from the customer's viewpoint, not from the institution's viiewpoint. Yeah, that's right. And it's time to break those silos between enrollment and marketing uh, in higher ed. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about the brand, discovering the brand like Apple's. They they did a good job of being top of mind of everybody's uh, buying decisions. But let's say you have a smaller school out there that needs to be discovered. Uh, yeah, through organic search. Um, how does web smart writing intersect with search engine optimization? And are there strategies you recommend to ensure that content isn't just readable but also highly discoverable on the web? Right. No, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I joined Alliance, at that point, I had probably done a few million uh, Google searches on my own. And you could have told me that Harry Potter was in charge of Google, and I would have believed you. I mean, I really did not understand uh, how the algorithm was working and the relationship between the content that's, you know, we say above, you know, above the hood and the code that's underneath the hood, how those two things are sort of cooperating in order to create uh, a, a Google result. Um, I still, you know, I'm still in kindergarten when it comes to really understanding the algorithm, but, you know, between Abu, who's got a background in computer science and the SEO team here, you know, I'm learning every day the, the ways in which that connection between code and content is so, so, so vital. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, in order to communicate this, I, at one point I started talking about the contrast between having a promotional mindset and a publishing mindset. Um, I don't know if that'll help others, but it's helped me make sense of, of this world. Um, you know, so often I, I work and interact and collaborate with higher ed partners who really are in that promotional mindset. You know, higher ed likes to hire alumni to work, especially in areas like enrollment and marketing, because, you know, they think people bring this inherent optimism, uh, belief, enthusiasm for the product. And all, all of that is great, you know, especially, you know, on a, on a, on the ground face-to-face -face encounter between you and a, and a prospective donor, student, family, that enthusiasm comes through. So I'm not saying that's not never relevant, but when you look at the world through the eyes of Google and the Google algorithm, um, the algorithm is really neutral. You know, it doesn't really care how much you love your college. Uh, you can you can inject all the enthusiasm you want into the content. Um, that's not what the Google bot reads for. You know, it reads for meaning and, and association. You know, it, it has a it has a natural language processing brain, which is trying to say, um, take for instance, um, philosophies. You know, many, many of the clients that we work with have philosophy programs and they have very, very few students. 
So there are philosophy programs all over the country that are sort of at jeopardy in jeopardy because you know, from from a board level, presidential level, they look at those programs and they think, well, they're cost centers, not revenue centers. Um, and there's a lot of sort of just blind acceptance. Well, that's the way it is. Um, but I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine had a son who went to school in New Jersey and he majored in philosophy. And like any parent, my friend was, you know, concerned. He thought, what's, what's, what will become of my son? Um, and so a group of Silicon Valley companies showed up at the college. And the first thing they said to the career center was cancel all our appointments. Um, they said the only students we want to meet with are philosophy students. Um, and they hired you know, a slew of them, including my friend's son, and took them to Silicon Valley. And what the company said was, we do not have time to teach you how to think. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of time and resources and people who can teach you the business, the product, the customer, the market, but we can't teach you the fundamentals of thinking. And you already know that. And so for us, you are an asset. Um, but you know, the first thing I do when I meet a prospective client is I go to their program pages and I read their philosophy page, program page, and I read their economics program page. And you know, 99 out of 100 times, the content on those pages could have been written in 1953 or 1973. It really hasn't been updated for the reality of what these programs mean in terms of career opportunity. Uh, yeah. And I think that's an example of how the Googlebot is coming along to your website every day. You know, it doesn't take a vacation. It doesn't go to lunch. It, it comes faithfully every day and it lands on your philosophy page and it says, does this college care about philosophy? And if so, how so? Um, and if you write that program content in a way that communicates both to the human reader and the Googlebot that you care about philosophy as it relates to today's realities in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of uh, the ways in which um, any online uh, company or product uh, or application thinks about the value of an, of an economist in a completely different way than we might have when all the economists went to DC and sort of swam in this big you know, sea of government data and tried to make sense of it. That's not what a lot of economists do today. They're working for Airbnb trying to figure out what is it about uh, a client's path through a website that makes them routinely abandon their purchase at this stage rather than that stage or makes them complete their purchase. Mm -hmm. So if you can start to think differently about the content on your webpage or on your social media, you can sort of get inside the mind of the Google algorithm. And then the trick always is to, you know, and this is something I'm still learning to do, which is you're always learning to write for two audiences at once. Mm. You're writing for a human being and you're writing for the Google bot. And the trick is for the human to never know that you're writing for the bot and for the bot to never know that you're writing for the human. Mm. And that's, that's web smart writing. You, know? you right. mentioned that you go to the philosophy page, to the economics page, and then you notice that you don't know whether this content was written in 1950s, 1970s. Can you share some explanations, some success stories of you going in with Alliance where web smart writing made a difference, a significant difference in one of your higher ed clients? Yeah, you know, the example that, that comes to mind is uh, John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, you know, like many of our clients, like many schools in the country, you know, it's been around for, you know, more than 150 years. Um, you know, it's faith-based. It's got a, a, a Jesuit, uh, um, you know, origin story and, and, and charism. Um, and, you know, they, they had not had uh, an increase in enrollment for three consecutive years for more than a decade. You know, so their enrollment might tick up and then it would fall down, it would tick up, it would fall down. And they were really trying to sort of answer the question, you know, what is it about our product and our customer that, that our customer is sort of losing faith in us? Mm -hmm. um, so they were, you know, I give them credit for being brave enough to ask that question, to have the courage to ask that question. Um, and uh, what I like about the John Carroll story is that we were able to work with the president from the start and develop a, a brand position you know, even more than a brand line or a tagline, a real position um, and, and you know, and, and a promise that came out of that. And the promise was the future will not surprise you. You will surprise the future. Um, and that was a very different promise that, that they were had begun 
to make to their um, prospective students and their current students and their families, you know, the people often paying the bill. Um, and I think it really, it really caught fire in the sense that, that it resonated with parents and families and prospective students, because it's easy to get caught up in this sort of rhetoric that exists that, well, maybe college isn't the path or maybe college isn't worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, there are thousands, if not millions of ways to waste your time and money on college. But there are, in fact, a few ways to really make it pay. Mm -hmm. um, and we were determined to, through the brand and through the content uh, and the tools that we developed to communicate to prospects that they could make these degrees pay. They could make a philosophy degree really pay. They could make a theology degree really pay. They mm -hmm. could make a music degree really pay. Um, you know, there's some really interesting writing out there about the ways in which a lot of these faith-based colleges are being convinced to sort of create more um, vocational type majors because there's a, you know, like an immediate market need. They look out and they see a hospital that needs uh, technicians. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, they will eliminate their math, chemistry and philosophy programs and create a much more applied program. But yeah. if, you look at, if you look at artificial intelligence studies at the careers that are most vulnerable in terms of being replaced by AI, it's all those vocational technical careers. So these colleges are trying to do the right thing in the near term. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you think about that person's life, that, that graduate's life four years from now, six years from now, eight years from now, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're young. They're like they're they're 20 years old. They have a long work life ahead of them. Um, and so I think a lot of colleges are starting to rethink whether or not they really want to sort of solve their revenue problems by just creating vocational degrees that maybe these more enduring degrees that have been around forever, maybe they have application that's sort of beyond the reach of, of AI and a lot of technology. Um, so I think in the case of John Carroll, we really went through a, a comprehensive strategic process of looking at all their majors and saying, how can we bring this promise? The future will not surprise you, you will surprise the future, right down to the ground for the communications program, for the history program for the political science program. Um, and then uh, from a content standpoint, uh, Chris, what we did was we developed three really important channels. So we developed two blogs. Uh, mm -hmm. One is a broad academic blog and one blog is exclusive to the president mm -hmm. um, because we thought it was important that the president be, you know, Abu likes to use the phrase chief prosperity officer. Mm -hmm. You know, the president is the face of the brand. Uh, he's the one sitting with donors in California and Florida and Texas and elsewhere, sort of making the case for why John Carroll should be, um, you know, the benefactor of a major gift. So those two blogs were really important. And then we developed a digital magazine because a lot of times what's happening in higher ed is that the best content, um, you know, is is locked up in in one of those flip book uh, tools. Uh -huh. um, and it might be okay for the human reader. The human reader might not mind flipping through that thing digitally. But those things are completely inaccessible to the Google bot. So you're doing all that work, you're writing all that content, you're pouring your heart and soul into it, but it's not truly digitized. So the so every day when the Google bot indexes, it doesn't even know it exists. Yeah. So, you know, that for, for us, that's kind of tragic because you know, con you know this content is hard. You're creating content right now, right? It's mm -hmm. hard. It's labor, it's labor intensive. Um, and uh, it's a shame that some of the best content in higher ed doesn't see the light of day in terms of Google. And then on top of that, what we did with, with John Carroll and what we do with every client is we create what we would call a keyword lexicon or a keyword Bible so that we know what phrases are priority, long, long tail phrases for us um, across every program. So for instance, uh, in their school of business, they have a responsible um, supply chain program. Mm -hmm. uh, so we developed a whole slew of content around supply chain, some of it student focused, a lot of it faculty focused, some of it from the point of view of the president. And then we got them page one for sustainable um, supply chain programs um, and their enrollment more than doubled. Now, you know, there's a lot going on in the world and supply chain kind of became um, 
more in people's awareness. Mm -hmm. So we can't credit that increase in enrollment entirely to the effort, but the effort was definitely supportive. Um, and, you know, the faculty are happy. They were able to raise money. They created a new smart classroom so that the supply chain program will benefit from that. So that's the, you know, that's the virtuous so circle that we're always trying to create is like, it's not just about solving next year's enrollment number problem. We need to raise money. We need to change the momentum. We need to get alumni engaged uh, and we need to, we need Google to pay attention to you. So, yeah. So that was very interesting. What you just mentioned with the flip book. Um, I assume that's a PDF that's being uploaded. It's not accessible, right? By the Google bot. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That brought, that just, that just reminded me of something. I just wrote a white paper on the demographic enrollment cliff and the possibilities of, um, or the benefits of targeting non-traditional students um, to kind of balance that scale in the Northeast and the Midwest. But yeah. it's a PDF, right? And I'm going to put it on my website, on Hannah Hill website. It's not going to be found. So I have to find a way to repurpose this um, this content to bring awareness to it. Right. You know, I mean, I think we're all learning to to sort of uh, write once, create once, and publish often. Yeah. So, you know, every time we sit down and create an editorial calendar, we're not only thinking about a blog post, but we're thinking about how does that blog post then de deconstruct into a, a series of social posts, um, you know, on Instagram and Facebook and, and elsewhere? Um, how does that um, blog post um, drive potential media um, attention? So, you know, you, ha you have to think about every content effort uh, yeah. in its sort of most democratized form where it it does good wherever it travels and you're not sort of recreating a wheel. Yes. And a lot of, you know, a lot of our higher ed clients, they produce content. I mean, um, you know, I'm working with a client, they produce 40 to 50 press releases a month. Um, and um, they have almost zero shares, zero likes, um, and they have zero um, Google results um, because there's been no intention put behind those 40 pieces of content. There's no, calendar or keyword guide driving any of it so it's all random um so that's where you know we try to very slowly sort of introduce clients to the idea that your time is valuable and your you know your content creators are valuable let's let's get them to do things that are ultimately productive for you um yeah, yeah. and it's very deflating for the content creator to see that none of their efforts gain any traction and then when they see that, then the quality of the content slowly goes down because they're like, what? Well, why bother, right? <laughs> right. Is it anyways? Um, right. Whereas, you know, I mean, when I first joined Alliance, I had I had written six thousand word magazine articles, you know, and I I felt like real proud of myself. And you know, the team would say to me, "Well, we need you to write one hundred fifty six character meta description." I'd be like, "One hundred fifty six characters." You know, but when they showed me the value of that in terms of its ability to to turn the Google bot's attention, mm -hmm. then I knew I had entered a whole new world. You know, then I knew that all these years of developing a writing uh, craft could be applied in a whole new way with dram yep. dramatic immediate feedback, you know. Um, and uh, so I think you're right. I mean, writers like to be incentivized like anyone else. And if you can show them that their work has immediate results, um, it's a good good feedback yeah it's like with this podcast i put a lot of time and effort into it and when i see the engagement of it from a prior episode i'm like hey this is actually bringing value let's do another one let's do it better right, right. Um, exactly. exactly let's talk about some common mistakes that you've seen um or that you've encountered when working with universities while they're trying to implement web smart writing and how they can avoid it just real quick real brief something yeah, um, you know, I think the thing you brought up earlier about information is really a, a, a common mistake is that people, you know, a lot of a lot of departments are really organized around the idea of, well, if we only meet the information need, then we've done our job, right? If we get that press release out, we've done our job, we've checked that box, we've made that dean happy, um, we've made that faculty person happy. Um, but, you know, if, if that content is not in turn being productive for you, mm. then you know, that's that's a common mistake is really getting them to think in terms of productivity rather than in terms of information. I think the second mistake that I see a lot and in, increasingly is that, you know, I have a client that hired nine people in one sort of enrollment cycle, one, one communications department hired nine people. Um, and I think every job title had the word communications or communicator in it. Um, 
But among the nine people that they hired, none of them had any reporting experience and none of them had any writing experience. So I think a common mistake that I see is that um, managers increasingly sort of place all the value on the experience somebody has with the, the tool. You know, they they know hand and nail, they know HTML, they know, you know, they know Instagram, they know, um, and very little value is placed on, well, but how much writing and reporting have they done? Mm -hmm. um, and so, unfortunately, there's kind of a mismatch because in order to communicate to both the human and the Google bot, you really need to be comfortable with the idea of, uh, I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to call the economics professor, I'm going to ask them about that competition, I'm going to go sit in the room with the team that's competing in that competition, I'm going to sit back and watch their process, I'm going to get to know them as people, as contributors to this effort, um, and then I'm going to write a really killer story uh, about it. And that's a that's a discipline, that's a craft, and uh, unless you hire for it, uh, you're not going to be able to execute on it when the time comes, so. Yeah, yeah. With your, as we bring the episode to a close, yeah. With your vast experience in reporting in, um, in web creating and content creating, what is one important lesson that you have learned over the course of your career that you can share with the audience? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think the some a colleague once said to me, uh, "Writing is thinking." Mm -hmm. uh, so there you go, three three words, right? Why did I remember that? Um, and I think the lesson I've learned throughout my career is that you have to be in the frame of mind. You have to have the point of view to think. Um, and the best way to get in that frame of mind is to make yourself uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, a lot of people that work in higher ed, higher ed can be a very comfortable place. You know, it can be like flying back to the nest. Uh, everybody feels at home. It's a familiar surrounding. They love the the idea of working for their alma mater and the idea that they might make themselves uncomfortable is sort of anathema to them. That's not really, you know, I mean, so I have some strange, you know, habits, if you will. I like to go to laundromats all around the city where I, where I live uh, because laundromats are these incredibly democratic places where people from every walk of life come. The reason why someone is, is in a laundromat can vary from, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but I find that there's something about being in a laundromat that sort of brings my senses and my, my acuity of my eyes and ears uh, back to life. You know, my father was a trailways bus driver, so I grew up on the road and I spent most of my childhood in truck stops and uh, bus depots. And, you know, I got to see persuasion at work uh, at the, in the most elemental ways across the full splendor of human diversity. Um, and so, you know, I will, I will get on a city bus to make myself uncomfortable. Um, I will go to a church that I've never been to to make myself uncomfortable. So I say, if you're a young writer, find something in your life that's extremely uncomfortable for you and make a practice of it, you know, and you will, you will find, I, I think that it will awaken something in you. Um, you know, I, I got to interview uh, Bill Moyers once, the old CBS uh, news uh, legend. And, uh, you know, he said the key to his job is to remain in a childlike state as long as he can. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of what I'm getting at is um, if you're gonna do this work, you need to be curious. And you need to learn to support and feed your curiosity, however, however you do that. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. That was profound. I love it. Yeah. And I want to try to get a little bit more uncomfortable in the days to come. Uh, yeah. To find that inner child again. Um, You'll survive. Let's um, tell the people how they can connect with you, get in touch with you, or even partner with Alliance if they choose to do so. What's the best way to contact you? Sure. So on the web, Eliance, it's E-L-L-I-A-N-C-E. -E. Um, and my last name is Urkel, much like the character on the show, Steve Urkel, spelled differently, but uh, E-R-K-E-L. You can you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find Eliance on the web. And um, we have blogs. Uh, so we uh, uh, we we try to practice what we preach. Um, so check out our blog content. See if it it matches with your needs. Uh, again, we're a full service firm. Uh, sometimes we only do SEO work for somebody. Sometimes we only do web development. Sometimes like with John Carroll, we did, we did everything from, from the ground up, from the brand up. So, um, 
it's good to be with you. I look forward to the webinar next week. Very good. I'll be sure to tag you and I'll be sure to tag Alliance in the recap on LinkedIn. So Todd, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. I really appreciate your time and I will see you next week, my friend. Thanks, Chris. See you.